We'll be back after these messages. Grandpa, tell me the sun-kissed story again. Ah, the magical land of the sun-kissed factory. <laughs> and juiciest oranges ever wear the sun-kissed name. This weekend on Special Delivery. This is my cousin Tito. Oh, hi. Hi. You can pick your friends, but Mike's stuck with his cousin Tito. Tito goes, or you stay home. But he won't fit in. Everybody will laugh at him. I wish he never came. He's made my life miserable. Was he fighting over a girl? No. He was standing up for you. Welcome to Miami Cubanos, a special delivery, Saturday at 2.30, 1.30 Central, only on Nickelodeon. Meet Hearn Burford, ace reporter for the Out of Control team, with the top stories. It's a well-known fact that bologna and ice cream cause death when combined. The strong opinion. Nice ears does not a show business personality make, Dave. And the keen observation. Whoa! Beat! Oh, look at that! Mysterious beat! Ooh. He's Hearn Burford. Just one more reason to watch the Hearn Burford Show. No, Out of Control. Only on Nickelodeon. Every week, it's the same thing. Monday, school. Tuesday, school again. Wednesday, even more school. Thursday, it never ends. Friday, still in school. Sheepers. That's why there's the Nickelodeon Kids Only Weekend. All kids shows and only kids shows all weekend long. Oh, neat. Every weekend, Nickelodeon helps you forget about the rest of the week with great shows for kids only all weekend long. Oh, wow. The Nickelodeon Kids Only Weekend on Nickelodeon. You are watching Nickelodeon. And now back to Pinwheel. in the garden when King Frank arrived with his dog. What a beautiful dog, said King Rollo. Let's show him to cook. They ran indoors with the dog. Yes, yes, very nice, said Cook. Then she saw their muddy feet. Out you go, she said. Let's show him to the magician, said King Rollo. <laughs> Just what I needed said the magician as the dog knocked over his things. Why don't you take the dog for a walk, said the magician. They went outside to take the dog for a walk. Only most of the time, it was a run. told King Rollo the names of the different kinds of dogs that they saw. King Frank knew a lot about dogs.
he showed how to make a dog beg to say please. They threw a ball and the dog brought it back. They chased the dog. The dog chased them. At last, they were completely tired out. Come back and have some tea. Queen Gwen will be there, King Rollo said to King Frank. I can't, said King Frank. Before I can have tea, I must clean and feed the dog. Gosh, said King Rollo, you'll starve. He waved goodbye to King Frank and the dog and set off for home. All those people have to feed their dogs before they can have tea, he thought. At tea, King Rollo was still talking about dogs. I've learned a lot about dogs, he said to Cook. Do you know the best kind? asked Cook. Yes, said King Rollo. Someone else's. First morning in his new home, Paddington woke to the news that Mrs. Brown and Judy were taking him for a trip on the underground. There was also a large tray of breakfast things beside his bed. So much seemed to be happening at once, he had a job deciding what to do first. So he started on the bacon. Hurry up, called Judy. We're going shopping and it's nearly time to leave. Coming, cried Paddington. I've never been on an underground before, he announced. I'm not sure if you'll be going now, said Judy. Not with bacon sticking out of your suitcase like that. Look at it. It's for emergencies, said Paddington. Bears often have emergencies. In fact, I think I've got one coming on now. It's very strange, said Mrs. Brown. I've never heard so many dogs. Perhaps it's the fine weather bringing them out. I don't think it's the weather, Mrs. Brown, gasped Paddington. I think it's my bacon. What's left of it? After the excitement of Windsor Gardens, Paddington found the underground much more to his liking, and he hurried on ahead of the others. Everything seemed to have been thought of. There was a moving staircase, pictures on the wall. There was even a sign with his name on, showing which way to go. Paddington, cried Judy, you're going the wrong way. But it was too late. By the time he'd realized his mistake, Paddington was at the top of the stairs again. Here, yeah, said the ticket collector. What's all this? You haven't been anywhere yet. I think I must have made a mistake at the bottom, said Paddington. Bert, called the collector, there's a young bear here smelling of bacon. Says he's made a mistake at the bottom. I'm sorry, said Paddington. I'm not used to escalators. We don't have any in darkest Peru. Darkest Peru, repeated the inspector. Oh, well, in that case, you'd better get back down, but don't let me catch you up to any more tricks. You're worse than them dogs. Shoot, go away. There he goes again, cried Judy. Do something, Paddington. That, said Mrs. Brown, was a dangerous thing to say. I think he's done it. You again, said the inspector. I'll have you no escalators. It's for the convenience of passengers, not for the likes of young bears to play on. 
It doesn't seem very convenient to me, said Paddington. I've been here ages and I haven't got anywhere yet. We're supposed to be going shopping, said Mrs. Brown. That's as may be, said the inspector sternly. But pressing the escalator stop button without a very good reason is against the rules. Persons are expected to abide by the rules. Did you say persons, asked Judy? That's right, and I've got my job to do. It's bad enough being pestered by dogs. Well, Paddington's not a person, said Judy. He's a bear. Isn't that lucky? Mmm, said the inspector. Mm-mm. Well, don't let it happen again. I think you're a very kind inspector, said Judy. Don't you, Paddington? Very, agreed Paddington. In fact, he announced, I shall always travel from here in future. It's a very good station if you don't want to go anywhere, especially if you have an emergency on the way. two cousins had come to stay with him. The two girls were both pop music fans. They pestered Simon to draw a pop singer. Simon went to his blackboard and drew what they wanted. Later that day, Simon was near the fence when he met the sergeant of the chalk drawing land band. He was very angry. It's impossible to play band music anymore, Simon. We need help. Simon went to the land of chalk drawings. And he couldn't believe his eyes. All the children were leaping madly up and down in time to pop music coming from a large speaker. The teacher looked annoyed. All the children are playing truant today, Simon. They prefer to dance. The flowers were upset. Do something for goodness sake. We're all being flattened. Simon decided to help. He followed the lead from the box until he came to the end of it. It was plugged into an electric guitar. Playing the guitar was Simon's pop singer. He was singing at the top of his voice. Peace for the people! He broke off when he saw Simon. 
I'm sending a message of peace to the people of this land, Simon. Simon blinked. But it was peaceful before. The pop singer shrugged. It's not now. Well, Simon had to agree. No, that's because you're singing so loudly. The pop singer strummed his guitar. But if I don't sing loudly, no one will hear me, right? And he started another song. What we want, what we gonna get. The din was louder than ever. What we want is peace, Lord. It was so loud, even the sun couldn't stand it. He hid behind the cloud. The cloud began to get angry because there was nowhere he could hide. The cloud became angrier and angrier. Finally, he could stand the din no longer, and for the first time in his life, he lost his temper and sent down a bolt of lightning. The lightning struck the huge speaker, which exploded in a puff of smoke. The change was like magic. With no more deafening music, the children had nothing to dance to. They went back to school, which pleased the teacher. It pleased the flowers, too because they wouldn't be trodden on anymore. The band started to play. The sun came out again. And everything was back to normal. Mm, 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 mm. Peace. The pop singer tried Peace. to sing, but now no one could hear him. Simon went home feeling sorry for him. And he had an idea. He drew a smaller speaker so that when it rained during school playtime, the pop singer could sing and play to the children. And the cloud who was feeling guilty at destroying the big speaker made sure it rained at least once a week. I don't know. I I can't sleep. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Well, maybe you should uh, count sheep. Well, I tried that, but it never worked. They made so much noise jumping over the bed, going. Ah! Ah! Come down! Ah! Come down! Ah! Come down, ah! down Linus. They did. Well, if sheep don't work, maybe maybe you could count giraffes. That's it. Giraffes don't make any sound at all. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You see. I've never seen more than two giraffes at a time at the zoo. Besides, they're so tall, they never fit in this room anyway. Oh, you got a point. <sighs> yeah. I suppose I could count the stars, but then I'd have to go to sleep standing up. Oh, that's true. Yeah. But well, there must be some way we could put you to sleep. Yeah. Sometimes when I can't sleep, Aurelia sings to me. It must be the middle of the night by now, and I mm. certainly don't want to wake her up. Wait! Wait, wait! I have an idea! You do? If music put you to sleep, yeah. well, why don't you turn on the radio? The radio, yeah! That's a great idea. I'll just turn the radio on. It's, uh, it's the uh, little knob right at the bottom there. Oh, yeah, here it is. You're tuned to the peaceful slumber sounds of S. <sighs> Snooze on your dial. And this is Phil Pillow speaking and whispering. Good night. That concludes our nightly edition of Bach to Bed. Next up is the middle of the night show. And now here's your new host. I can sleep forever now. So can I. Oh, boy. Good night. Good night, good night Minus. Yeah, good I'm night. Right oh, I'm so sure tired. Oh, I'm beat. Boys! Boys, what on earth is going on up there? You've 
It was an ordinary Mars morning, peaceful and quiet, but... This is becoming a habit, thought the mouse. This mole is getting on my nerves. And he decided that for once, he would not ask him to come in. But moles are patient, and mice are curious. Quite suddenly, the mole burst out. You are sitting in your house quite calmly, while the astronauts had left a radio transmitter outside. Surely, this is of some interest to you. interest in technical matters. When the mouse saw the radio transmitter, he knew at once what he could use it for. It was the chance of his life. should try a little better. On Earth, the mouse's extraordinary performance was received there, a little garbled. The army was worried, and the scientists were completely confused. recognized the voice at once. That is our brother, they exclaimed. But the officer didn't believe it. An Earth mouse on Mars, it's a space creature. No, it's our brother from here. Come to his house and we'll prove it. The milkman has come and gone with deliveries a hundred times. And now everybody knew it was the Earth Mouse who was singing from outer space.
We'll be back after these messages. Nickelodeon knows that in a world filled with villains, evildoers, and sinister laughers, you can never have enough superheroes. That's why now, every Monday through Saturday at 7 36 30 Central, Danger Mouse is joined by the world's newest superhero, Banana Man. I'm terribly strong, you know. He's Banana Man with the strength of 20 men. 20 big men. Now, Banana Man is joining Danger Mouse to save the world every Monday through Saturday at 7 36 30 Central, only on Nickelodeon. My hero. Sound the trumpet. <laughs> Shout hip hip hurrah! Because a shop full of brand new today's specials are coming your way. No kidding. All this month, see brand new songs and brand new dances, brand new games, and brand new stories. Right? What a way to celebrate the new year. <laughs> brand new today's specials all this month, right here, only on Nickelodeon. On the Lord of Hero, Nick. On the Lord of Hero, Nick, Nick. On the Ricky Dicky Low, I live in number one, Nickelodeon. Baby, no way a little dude like you is gonna change my ways. It's time we were tempted with a taste of nuts and honey. Hulk Hogan doesn't eat nuts and honey. Did you can take this. It's an unbeatable part of this nutritious breakfast. That's better than a body slam. <laughs> Sad face. And this. Happy face. Right. Now, over here, that's a sad face, huh? And a happy face over here. But these are not ordinary faces. Oh, no. These are faces of the planet Earth, the planet we live on. This is how Earth looks when it feels happy. And this is how Earth looks when it feels sad. So what are we going to do today? We're going to figure out which one of these little scenes up here will make the earth feel happy and which ones will make the earth feel sad. Now, if you have your picture page A5, get it ready to go. You know where we start, right? That's the picture with the star. That's right. And what's this young lady doing? Hmm? She's eating a piece of candy, and she's throwing her candy wrapper on the ground. And what makes it so bad is that she's passing up the litter can. Now, somebody who's littering up the earth, you think that would make the earth happy or sad? Huh? She's making it sad. She sure is. Faked you, didn't I? But that's what it is. Okay. Now, we go to number two. Here's the young... What's he doing? He's tramping on top of all of the flowers. He's crushing the flowers of the earth. Huh? You think the earth's going to be happy or sad about that? Having them crushed and squashed by this guy who's just wandering. Goodness knows how many he's really... We, we just see what he's doing here. So is the earth sad or is it happy? It's, it's happy? Okay. What? I ma okay, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Okay. I'll erase it, and it's, thank you, because he made a mess. See, I knew this guy. His name was Harold Mess. He always made a mess. No matter what he did, he was just happy making a mess, you know. And everybody said, Harold, you're just a mess. So he just went out, and we, we all got together. We said, you're a mess, and you stop it. And I'm proud to say that today, to this day, he is now president of the American Soap and Water Company, the cleanest company in the world, at least it was until he made a mess of it. Well, we just finished with uh, picture number two here, so we're going on to number three. Look at that. What's she doing? She's watering the plants. And, and she's smiling. That's a great thing, see? So you can tell she's happy about what she's doing. She's watering the flowers. 
which would make the earth happy, wouldn't it? Okay, so we're making the earth happy. <laughs> Fooled you, didn't I? You thought I was going to the sad picture. No, the earth's happy. All right, number four. The young fellow feeding the birds. Mm, look at those birds. They're eating, and you can almost hear them chirping away, can't you? Yes. So the birds are happy. And birds are good, good little things, man. They go around and they eat up some of the bugs that are bothering you, you know? Yeah, I know that the earth is happy. Happy. Right. And you're happy. And I'm happy. So while we're all happy, I can go home. Picture pages, picture pages, lots of fun with picture pages, lots of fun with crayons and with pencils. You can play with picture pages, fill your day with picture pages, till Bill Cosby does another picture page with you. To order your picture pages, send $1 for your monthly issue to cover the cost of publishing, postage, and handling to Picture Pages, Box 720, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15230. She's a pet. She's a pal. She's Black Beauty. Follow the adventures of Black Beauty every day on Nickelodeon. You're watching Nickelodeon. And now back to Pinwheel. Shaking my antenna to it, you hear? Oh, it's way on. Yeah. You know what, Jake? There's a, there's a question I'd like to ask you, and it's it's been on my mind for a while. Yeah? Can I ask you? Sure. Well, it's kind of a heavy question, if you don't mind. Not at all. Do you think that you'll remember me in 50 years? Well, I remember you in the 50 years. I think so. You will, huh? Remember me in 50 years. How about 10 years? Will you remember me in 10 years? Well, I remember you in 10 years. Sure. Well, that's good to know. How about one year? Yeah. One year? You remember no me problem. One year? Good. Six months? One day. One day, yeah. One week. Yeah, sure. One minute. One minute? One minute. Yeah. How about one second? Well, I remember you in one second. Will you remember me in one second? Sure. Oh, Jake, knock, knock. Oh, who's there? Forgot me already. I'm sorry. Pinwheel Playhouse presents more powerful than an oatmeal, smarter than an old sneaker, and really good looking. It's Captain Minus. Yes, yes. There, there, Joanne. Pull yourself together. 
try to think back. Try to remember where you lost those mittens. Well, yes? I remember yes? that I came in and took my mittens off and said, this time I'll remember where I put my mittens. <laughs> Joanne! Bobby gets upset when I lose my mittens. Yes, well, I'm beginning to understand why. Now concentrate. Okay. You're remembering. Yes. What happened next? I... I... Yes? I yes, yes? <laughs> I remember a case I had last week just like this one. It involved three little kittens who lost their mittens. <gasps> just like in the nursery rhyme. Let's see I, now. How I remember. I remember Let's where see. I lost my mittens. You see? I told those little kittens who lost their mittens, and I quote, let's see now, what did those little kittens say? Let's see, something to the effect of... Look, look, Leave them alone, and they'll come home wagging their little tails behind them. Uh, what? Oh. <laughs> I'm not remembering. This can't be right. <laughs> there, there, Captain Midas. Let me help you. Uh, was it Hey Diddle Diddle, the Bitten and the Fiddle? No, 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 no. That's, oh. that's not it. Um, how about Mitten, Mitten on the Wall? Who's taking Fairy Glove Mother to the ball? No, that's not right. Uh, how about Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water? Jack came down without his mittens because he thought he ought to? No, that's not it. Um, how about Mary had a little lamb who lost her mittens white as snow. Her fingers were nearly frozen stiff whenever the wind did blow. No. <laughs> Four and twenty black birds baked in the pie. If I eat with my mittens on, they'll never ever die. No, 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 that's uh, not it. Check uh, me, Nimble, check me quick. If you don't wear your mittens, you could get sick. Oh. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, fell to the ground, mittens and all. No, no, no. Oh. Peter, Peter, Mitten Eater ate his clothes because they were sweeter. Oh, come on, we got to take this one <laughs> Have over. Have you ever thought about changing that hairdo? This is happy time, where all the people live in hats. This little boy with a great big hat on is Sancho. And this is Carrot, who is Sancho's very special friend. Today's story is called Carrot's Carrot. Carrot spread his front legs out and rested his chin on the ground. This was his favorite thinking position. Hello, Carrot, said Sancho. What are you thinking about today? I'm thinking that I'm very unhappy because I've lost my carrot, said Carrot. Oh, not again, not again, said Sancho. And he inspected the end of the stick where Carrot's large, juicy carrot should have been. Carrot's was hopeless without his carrot dangling a few inches in front of his eyes. Without it, he was just bone idle. There's no point in my moving at all if I haven't got my carrot to go for, he said. I think I'll just sit here until you buy me a new one. Well, you can sit there forever, said Sancho. I'm not going to spend my pocket money on carrots for you. You'll jolly well have to think hard and remember where you left it. And with that, off he went. Simon, the Hattie Town detective, came along. As always, he was peering through his huge magnifying glass. Mm -mm. Do I perceive a donkey in distress? He said, peering at Carrot through his magnifying glass. Yes, you do, said Carrot, in no mood for conversation. Mm -mm. Now, now, don't tell me what's wrong. Don't tell me, said Simon. I shall find the clue which will lead me to discover the cause of your unhappiness. And with that, he began to examine Carrots through his magnifying glass.
I'm not very much mistaken, he said triumphantly. That stick should have a big juicy carrot dangling from the end of it. I don't think that's very clever, sulked Carrot. Now, if you could find my carrot for me, that would be clever. Nothing simpler, nothing simpler, said Simon. If you just answer a question or two, I shall certainly apply all my detective skills towards finding the missing carrot. Now then, uh, when do you last recall seeing your carrot? Carrot resumed his thinking position. I definitely had it this morning when I was helping Mr. Bun in his bakery, said Carrot. I remember I accidentally knocked a pot of pepper into a bag of icing sugar with it as I turned round. Mr. Bun was very angry. Aha, uh -huh. mm-hmm, said Simon. And do you remember having it since you left, Mr. Buns? No, said Carrot firmly. No, I don't. In that case, I shall begin my investigation for the missing Carrot at Mr. Bun's bakery, said Simon. And off he went. <laughs> outside his bakery when Simon arrived. He explained to Mr. Bun and Sancho that he had accepted the task of finding Carrot's carrot, and he asked for permission to examine certain items in the bakery. Of course, of course, Mr. Bun agreed. Anything to help? What would you like to examine first, Simon? Mm -hmm. Your flour, please, said Simon. Yes, your flour first, please. You wait here, said Mr. Bun. I'll fetch a sack of my flour for you to inspect. accidentally knocked it over, and all the flour spilled onto the ground. My flour! My flour! cried Mr. Bun. Yeah, calm yourself! Calm yourself! said Simon, trying to explain away his carelessness. It is my job to be absolutely thorough. I can leave no stone unturned, and I must examine this sample of your flour <clears throat> very closely. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And now, I would like to examine, he continued before Mr. Bun could protest further, I would like to examine a sack of your currants. Mr. Bun was reluctant to fetch another sack of anything for Simon to examine, but he finally relented, and off he went. <laughs> unaware of the distress he was causing poor Mr. Bun, and he continued to examine very closely the contents of both sacks. At that very moment, along came Mr. Wimple, the mayor. 
He was carrying two halves of a loaf of bread, one half in each hand. Look! He thundered, glowering at Mr. Bunn. Look what I found in the middle of my loaf of bread. A carrot! A carrot, of all things! It's positively outrageous! I demand an explanation. Uh, 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 well, stuttered Mr. Bunn. You may well, uh, 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 well, my good man. I am waiting for your explanation, cried Mr. Wimple. Simon, who didn't notice the mayor's arrival, continued to sift through the flower and currant looking for clues. And since Mr. Bunn was speechless, Sancho took command of the situation. Uh, Mr. Wimple, he said, please don't be too hard on Mr. Bunn because it's not really his fault. Carrots lost his carrot this morning while helping in the bakery. And Mr. Bunn has given every assistance to Simon to help him find the carrot. Unfortunately, all our efforts seem to be too late. Carrot's carrot must have fallen into the mixing bowl while he was helping Mr. Bunn, and no one noticed. We're very sorry. Truly we are. Sancho's eloquent explanation of how Carrots had worked so hard to help Mr. Bunn soon calmed Mr. Wimple down. In fact, Mr. Wimple began to feel sorry for Carrots and even gave Sancho some money with which to buy another carrot. Carrots was very thrilled to receive a new carrot from Sancho. You have to have something to aim for in life, he said wisely. And in my case, it, it happens to be a carrot. Come on, Sancho. Let's go and help poor old Simon to clear up the mess he's made. After all, he was only doing his best to help. It is really all my fault. What's this all about? You are the pinwheel pin up of the week. That's right. What? Who? Who me? Pinwheel pin up? Yes. Oh, oh! Isn't that wonderful, my little fruit and veggie friends? What an honor! Oh, I, I'm going to take your picture now, O'Brien. Take your picture. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, yes, O'Brien? Wh what's the matter? Well, well, well you see, I, I know that being pinwheel pin of the week is a very great honor, but I'm afraid I must refuse unless my fruit and veggie friends are part of the picture, too. Oh, oh. As they say, where would I be without them? Oh, oh, that's no problem, is it, Smitty? Oh, not at all. That's a good idea, O'Brien. You can all be pinwheel pinups of the week. Wonderful. Right. Okay, now, I'll get this now. One, two, three, hold still. There. Oh, that oh, that's was wonderful. great. You all look terrific. Thank you. Now then, O'Brien, uh, could you answer a few questions for me for our readers of the Daily Noodle? Sure. Sal, have you got something to write on? No, I guess not, Smitty. Mm. Oh, oh, yes, Smitty, Smitty. Use my fancy veggie paper. Well, thank you, O'Brien. That's great. Now then, uh... Could you tell me, why are fruits and vegetables so important? Oh, of course I can tell you. First of all, they're beautiful. And, uh, let's see, well, they're healthy and nutritious, and they're also tasty and delicious. <laughs> and, and now, Brian, do you have a, a, some sort of a motto? I mean, in other words, uh, words that you live by? Why, yes, I do. Yes, a bit of philosophy I picked up from an old tomato friend of mine who always used to say, in the vegetable world, they sing an old ballad. If life is a garden, then heaven's a salad. Oh, oh well, thanks a lot, O'Brien. Well, you're welcome. I've got nice. to get this right back to the Daily Noodle. Yes, bye. See you at the Daily Noodle, O'Brien. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Pinwheel pinup. <laughs>
this little monkey Why is he curious? Let's go and see Curious George goes camping George and his friend, the man with the yellow hat, were going on a camping trip. George had never camped out before. They had a big trailer attached to the back of their little blue car. In the trailer were all the things they'd need for three days in the woods. Sleeping bags to sleep in, food to eat, and a lamp to light their campsite at night. A ranger greeted them at the entrance to the park. Uh, there is an empty space near the lake, he said. Have a good time camping and be careful not to hurt the woods or any of the animals that live there. This is a beautiful spot to set up camp, George, said the man with the yellow hat. They parked their car and started to unpack. I'll go to the lake to get us some water to cook with. You can look around the other campsites, but don't get into trouble. George saw a man and a woman taking a walk in the woods. They had packs on their backs. In another camping site, a father was cooking some fish for his family. He had caught the fish in the lake. Mmm, it smelled good. A little girl was pouring water from a bucket over their campfire. If I don't make sure the fire is out before we leave, she said to George, a spark might leap out and start a fire that could burn up the whole forest. George walked deeper into the woods. Around a bend in the trail, George saw a small tent. Inside the tent was a thin pole standing right in the middle. Suddenly, George heard footsteps. Somebody was coming. He jumped in and knocked over the pole. The tent fell down on him. Who's in my tent? The man shouted. Come out of there right now! His voice sounded angry. George crawled out and ran away. The man started to chase George. George climbed to the highest branch of a tall pine tree. Now he was safe. From where he was, he could see the entire campground. The man with the yellow hat was putting down a bucket of water beside their tent. George turned around and saw something scary. It was a thin trail of smoke coming from a campsite fire, and nobody noticed it. George had to stop the fire, and he knew just what to do. He leaped down and ran to get the bucket of water from his own campsite. He grabbed the bucket and ran past the other campers. Look at that little monkey, a camper shouted. Where's he running to? Daddy, I see smoke, yelled the little girl. The man with the yellow hat came rushing out of his tent. Fire, he shouted, let's go and they all ran towards the fire. George emptied his bucket. Everybody helped and poured water over the fire until it was put out. The ranger came to see what had happened. So did the man whose tent fell down. I was mad at you, George, said the man, but this sure made up for it. You're a real fine scout, said the ranger. George and the man with the yellow hat finally went back to their campsite. George, said the man, you did all right today. You deserve a good dinner. And we both learned a lot about camping today. Curious George, curious little monkey. Here he comes, he's always on the go. George, the curious little monkey. Where's he going? We'd all like to know. Curious George at the bakery. George was late for breakfast. You ought to have a good time at school today, George. Your class is going to the bakery. Now you'll find out where that toast came from. George grabbed his books and off he went to catch the school bus. Soon George and his classmates were on their way to the bakery. Welcome, said a big man in a white coat. 
I am the foreman. I make sure that everything in the factory is running smoothly. Just follow me and don't get lost. All the machines were humming and buzzing. Mmm, the bread smelled fresh and sweet. They came to a room where there was a machine that cut the fresh loaves into slices. Do you see the clock on the wall, asked the foreman. When the big hand and the little hand come together at the top, it will be noontime. And all the machines will stop automatically, and all the people who work here will go and have lunch. While the children were listening to the foreman, George wandered off. There was a door slightly open. Inside, a baker in a white t-shirt was making pretzels. He took some dough from a pan, rolled it into a long strip, and then folded the strip back and forth into a pretzel. After the pretzel was made, it passed under a salting machine. The baker pushed a long red lever, and down came the salt. George was curious. While the baker was putting a tray of pretzels in the oven, he leaped up on the table, took some dough, and rolled it into a strip. Then he tried to fold it with all four hands. Now George was all wrapped up in the dough. He tried to fight his way out, but instead fell right on top of the big red lever. George had started the salting machine. Salt poured all over the pretzels and onto the floor. So much salt that it spread through the door right into the hall. The foreman ran into the room. There is salt all over the fresh bread, he shouted. Who started the salting machine? The baker came running and pulled back the red lever to stop the salt. It was time for George to get away. He saw a big basket full of bread right near the factory clock. What a nice place to hide in. Let's get on with the tour, the foreman said to the children. Watch your step, the man said. From here you can see the machine working. Just then, one of the boys on the tour reached into his pocket to get his handkerchief. Something fell out. It was his pen knife. It bounced off the edge of the metal floor and landed on a fresh loaf of bread that was moving toward the slicing machine. Oh my, cried the foreman. If that knife gets caught in the slicer, the machine might break. There's no one near the machine to stop it. George heard the commotion and came out of hiding. How could he stop the slicing machine? He looked up at the factory clock. The little hand was up, but the big hand was still far away. How good that George was a monkey. He leaped over to the clock, held on to the little hand, and with his foot grabbed the big hand. Then, very quickly, he pulled the two hands together. And all the machines in the factory stopped. Hooray, shouted the foreman. The loaf of bread with the pan knife on it had stopped right in front of the slicing machine. George, said the foreman, what a clever monkey you are. You saved the slicing machine and your classmate's knife. For that, you deserve a good lunch. In the lunchroom, they all had sandwiches made out of the freshly baked bread. The foreman gave George a whole bag of warm pretzels with lots of salt on them. Then, George and his classmates went back home. Pinwheel will be back after these messages.